One of Seneca's most significant contributions was in the realm of so-called Menippian satire, which is a uh, it is a satire in prose as opposed to verse, and it is a early forerunner in uh, the way you think about it. Um, it is an early forerunner of uh, the novel. It is a narrative told in prose and often has some comic and satiric uh, import and requires a certain method of reading it ironically. That is the novel as we have it today, quite frankly, and he is one of the early forerunners of that. There are only a couple that really surfaced in the uh, in the Roman era, and uh, that uh, he gets credit for some of this. One of the the most significant uh, one we have from is one with the, uh, the rather silly title, The Apocalosymptosis, which means uh, the pumpkinification of Claudius. That well, that's the uh, that's the official title. There, uh, uh, pumpkinification is a curious word. Uh, there are no pumpkins in the uh, in, in 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 the work itself. No mention of pumpkins. Uh, sometimes they. Other people will title this, well, the gourdification, as if a pumpkin and a gourd are different. Uh, uh, that just kind of makes it even sillier, honestly, um, when you're trying to square that circle. Uh, okay. Um, the pumpkinification uh, title uh, uh, comes from a, uh, a, a, an historian quite a while after the uh, after Seneca was uh, was dead and gone so uh, the title is kind of irrelevant what it is is a uh, an imagined uh, court scene on the uh, the occasion of uh, the Emperor Claudius's death and it is a satire of course and so it is very uh, very funny and it pokes fun at the Emperor Claudius who had some peculiarities about him as most Roman emperors did uh, among the most notable of uh, of Claudius's peculiarities let's say or significances uh, is his interest in uh, the legal process. As emperor, he would preside over court cases. He would have, uh, he would have attorneys come in and argue their cases in front of him, and he would render judgment. Uh, you know, uh, he, maybe that's the job he should have had. Uh, he was a peculiar. Uh, well, again, they're all peculiar. Uh, a rather peculiar uh, uh, emperor. He was known for uh, for having some physical difficulties. Uh, history is uncertain, of course, uh, what exactly these were. He seems to have been a bit lame. His right foot was damaged uh, early in childhood, and he had some issues with that throughout his life. There's also talk about uh, he, uh, he perhaps had difficulty speaking, maybe as a stutterer. It's not certain. Uh, some people have speculated as far as saying that, well, he might have had uh, like cerebral palsy or something like that, uh, which is horrible, but we just don't know. Um, certainly medical science was not caught up to that then. Uh, and, and he had uh, the usual uh, issues with being a Roman emperor in that he tended to uh, 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 achieve power under some suspicious circumstances. Uh, he followed his nephew uh, Caligula, uh, who had his own issues, of course, but uh, uh, Caligula was assassinated and, well, Claudius, uh, his his role in that, uh, historians dispute that. The historians uh, will say, well, you know, we're not sure exactly how much he may have played a role in the assassination. Did he have any role? Um, they, they look at uh, his, his efforts to sort of wall off the Caligula um, um, uh, camp uh, in, uh, during his administration. And so there, there's some troubling suspicions there. And so he had some problems with that. 
Uh, and, you know, uh, when you are emperor, sometimes your relatives or rivals to the throne will turn up dead under shady circumstances. And, well, you know, what are you going to do? These things happen. So he was certainly ripe for a kind of satiric take. And Seneca is always happy to jump in and provide. Um, and what he does is um, is fun to read. It's a it's a very short work. It's only a few pages long, and it's it's funny. And it, it, you know, it, it's it's funny in that it's making fun of the leader, and that itself is a ironic pose and a uh, a pose of some independence that is, uh, uh, in a modern sense. Uh, sort of uh, refreshing and engaging in the idea that, you know, this is the proper uh, role that we as individuals should take towards people in authority, uh, to question them, to, uh, to not be overawed by the, uh, by, the, by, the, by the power and the magnificence, uh, but to hold them account, hold them to account for their own, uh, their own failings, quite frankly. And so, uh, so he 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 weaves together this little scene about the uh, the aftermath of the death of Claudius, and how he is now trying to gain access to essentially get get into heaven, um, uh, and and become uh, a a god. And to what he this is kind of a deification process, and apotheosis is the is the technical term where they're bringing uh, him up into the heavens. And so it takes uh, it takes the uh, the form of a court proceeding, quite frankly, and it begins with a this uh, this mock legalistic uh, opening, this oration, as if you can hear like an attorney coming and clearing his throat and saying, "Well, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, we are gathered here today too." And blah 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 blah. Uh, you know, I wish to place in on record the proceedings in heaven, October thirteenth last of the new year, which begins this auspicious age. It shall be done without malice or favor. Yeah, you know, this very formalistic. Um, legalistic language that automatically conjures Claudius and his little, you know, interest in the legal process. Um, significantly, his interest in the legal process, scholars go back and look and say, well, you know, he wasn't really trying to be an impartial judge very often. Uh, he just liked the, the for some reason, he kind of liked the the experience of it. He liked the role he was playing, where he gets to render judgment. Um, so they're, they're not really crediting him with a lot of uh, legal um, precedence here. Uh, his, uh, his his role or the uh, his contribution to legal theory has always been a little bit, you know, all right, you know, not not particularly inspiring. So it starts with this very uh, goofy um, opening and the idea that, okay, they're introducing him and uh, they're, uh, you know, he has, like I said, he has some baggage, so to speak, and they're bringing him in, they're considering him. And when they ask him or when they, uh, when they finally start to cast the light on him, um, they talk about, well, when he finally died. And this is, this is pure Roman satire right here in, in the, uh, the, the sophisticated level of it. Um, <clears throat> uh, the last words he was heard to speak on earth were these. When he had made a great noise with that end of him which talked easiest, he cried out, Oh dear, oh dear. I think I have made a mess of myself, <laughs> which is not the great heroic uh, death scene that really anyone would want. Uh, <laughs> um, it's not granting him uh, the dignity, certainly, that he enjoyed in life. Uh, that there's no evidence, of course, that Seneca was in the room to really relate this accurately as an historian. But uh, it's it, it's funny, and it gives that sense of earthy humor 
that undercuts the uh, the again the magnificence of the uh, of the Roman uh, emperor. Claudius very famously uh, rejected his own deification during life. Um, many uh, many emperors decided that well you know life would be better if you know, I was just declared myself a god. Uh, you know, it gives you just a little bit more oomph. It's, uh, it's that extra bullet point on the resume that really uh, pulls it over the top. He rejected that, but still, the pomp and the circumstance and the fussiness, and again, you could see he has a clear interest in being up on that uh, platform, perhaps, and having uh, people argue in front of him. That is uh, a very heady position to be in, and you know he wouldn't be the first, and certainly was not the last uh, leader to enjoy that kind of power and respect. Um, it's uh, it it can be quite the drunk, uh, or it can you know it can it can seem. Uh, like it's uh, like it's uh, an intoxicant, let's say. Um, and so they're casting. Uh, they're saying, okay, you know, do we want him in? And they're they're going around and asking all of these different uh, <clears throat> uh, witnesses to come and speak on his behalf. Uh, at at one point, the Greek hero Hercules is there, and <clears throat> uh, Jupiter, Jove. Roman Zeus uh, tells Hercules to go over there and uh, uh, ask him, you know, well, where is he from? Where is he from? What's going on with this? They, there's a bit, uh, there's a bit of confusion over uh, how to understand him. Uh, Claudius is famously from Gaul, not from Rome. Gaul is modern France, and the uh, uh, he, the language was uh, was perhaps a little bit different. Perhaps he had uh, uh, a bit of an accent, and don't forget as well, he had some physical uh, problems, some speech problems occasionally, and so making himself understood was uh, was always a challenge. You can feel bad about that, and. Perhaps that uh, elicits some sympathy, but still, what they're really going at here, I think, is that well, he's just you know, he's he's a little suspicious, um, and so they're making fun of him, you know, for for better for uh, for worse. Hercules questions Claudius with uh, what they say and says, "What your Greek finds readiest to his tongue? Who art thou, and why thy people, and what thy people? Who thy parents? Why thy home?" This, the thighs give you from the Loeb translation is a little old and stodgy, but the, uh, this is a quotation from the Odyssey. And it's a little bit of a tweak from a Roman perspective because in the Odyssey and in Homer and in all Greek literature, what you're not supposed to do is question somebody too directly. So these questions are something that have to appear uh, down the line of an evening. The Greek tradition of Xenia in, uh, insists that you invite visitors in and give them uh, give them food, entertain them, uh, make sure they're comfortable, let them wash up, maybe give them some new clothes. And then when they're really comfortable and everything is settled, then you uh, can ask them these questions like, you know, what do you want? Who are you? Um, but of course, here, uh, this is right at the beginning of the conversation that Hercules, uh, identified very specifically as a Greek, is offering up these questions and, and, and leaning into them. And because these questions do come up so often in, in Homer and in Greek literature in general, the, uh, it makes you wonder if this is the Romans sort of tweaking that whole, oh, you know, you have to invite them in. They make such a big deal about Zania and you don't question them. You don't, uh, you don't interrogate them too soon. Uh, maybe this is the Romans just saying, well, yeah, that was all just a farce. You know, that's, that's all just the PR. They, they, they were about as uh, open as anybody would uh, would be and so th there's that little tweak there um, but they bring in um, you know all of these people to come and question him and Claudius is originally feeling okay a little good about this Claudius in fact to that question he recognizes the uh, the uh, 
uh, the Homeric quotation and says, Claudius was delighted to find literary men up there and began to hope that there might be some corner for his own historical works. Claudius was an author of his own and now he seems like, oh, okay, you know, these are my sort. I'm, I'm very much at home here. They are all intellectuals like me. Um, you know, that, and they start trading Homeric quotations, not always appropriate ones. Uh, and, and you can see him sort of settling in. Um, the, uh, <clears throat> the complaints of uh, Claudius come out when he says at one point, uh, well, this is a court proceeding and he has done this so many times in the judge's role. Now he's just in the plaintiff's role, uh, uh, supposedly. And he complains a little bit about it. You know, he says, you know what miseries I endured there in hearing the lawyers plead day and night. Well, you know, that was his own choice. Why would he do that otherwise? Why are you complaining? What's, uh, what right have you to complain at this point? So that's a little curious. And he's in this format that he should be comfortable in, but he's, uh, he's griping about it. But the witnesses keep coming and saying, well, you know, maybe uh, he, he is sort of a scumbag. He, he has done some very questionable things. And I don't know that we should invite him in. Uh, maybe he, it is not proper to have him uh, enter, uh, enter the heavens with us. Um, perhaps he should be somewhere else. Uh, at one point... <clears throat> Hercules comes to him and even, you know, offers him a bit of a deal. Again, it's sort of a shady portrait of Hercules, who always has a bit of a weird uh, um, or a questionable uh, reputation in, in, uh, in, in ancient uh, culture. Um, he says, <clears throat> uh, he, uh, Hercules goes to Claudius, says, uh, for Hercules saw his iron in the fire trotted there and trotted here and trotted there saying don't deny me I'll make a point I'll make a point of the matter I'll do as much for you again when you like you roll my log and I'll roll your yours one hand washes the other he's looking to strike a little bit of a bargain saying look I can get you in here but you got to cover me on something else and it's all a little bit you know inside baseball with that but he's basically proposing a, uh, a an illicit bargain in that you can also see this very um, something that happens throughout the piece uh, a lot of uh, idiomatic sayings a lot of uh, a lot of jargon a lot of uh, just you know uh, you wash my one hand washes the other you roll my log I'll roll yours uh, there are a number of these throughout that don't always translate all that awkward uh, all that well but that are uh, uh, the kind of street lingo, the kind of common, ordinary speech that people have always engaged in, but that we don't necessarily ascribe to the great uh, figures of history, and especially, you know, people in great power. Uh, the great authorities are supposed to speak in this uh rolling cadence of wavy words and uh, when you just take that down a register when you put ordinary speech in i mean this is hercules the greatest of the greek uh, heroes necessarily uh when you take that down a register and have them speak in a kind of a you know uh, a slang it uh, it sucks some of the air out of them. It gives them a little bit more um, objectivity, or it gives the reader more objectivity in engaging with them. Um, the uh, bu, 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 uh, where did that go? Uh, Six forty-seven. There's a uh, at one. Uh, the opposition is piling up to uh, Claudius getting, uh, getting his way, and Augustus steps in, the great figure of Augustus, uh, who is, you know, long dead as, uh, himself at this point, and he weighs in, and he just starts asking questions about, well, what about all those people you had killed, or all those people who, you know, at least disappeared, uh, family members, 
uh, that you uh, got rid of to ensure your path to power? What, uh, what about them? And he's curious in that he questions their disappearance or their murdering, uh, their, uh, you know, whatever, as a, as a violation of due process, as a violation of justice. And this is curious. Um, they, uh, he seems to be quite upset that they, uh, they were denied basic rights. It's not a violation of his family so much as it is of the system. He's not, Claudius is not being held to account as much for being a terrible person as he is for violating the precept of justice and due process under the Roman system. And that seems to be the real object of Seneca's barbs here. He is concerned about rights. He's concerned about the dignity of the, uh, the Roman experiment. Uh, at one point they see, uh, they see Claudius's funeral train and it is uh, mostly lawyers um, clogging up there and you get an idea of, well, you know, who were jockeying for his favor always since he was kind of the, the, uh, the number one corrupt judge in town. Uh, lawyers were the ones who were always uh, seeking him out and so they would be the ones to show up and it's a little like, you know, uh, do you really want them there? You know, has anyone ever really liked lawyers? The, uh, the funeral train is thus a little bit pathetic and that kind of seals the deal when everybody sees that all right the uh that's what uh that's what he attracts that's his entourage claudius thinks it's great he's like hey yeah they're all coming out you know they're a motley crew of lawyers claudius was charmed to hear his own praises songs and would have stayed longer to see the show he wants to watch his own funeral which is you know understandable i suppose but um it's a, um, it's a lost cause at this point. He is rejected. And they, uh, they bring in some more witnesses. They seal the deal. It's just, you know, he's not getting in. There was a long discussion, discussion as to the punishment Claudius ought to endure. Some said that Sisyphus had done his job of porterage long enough. Tantalus would be dying of thirst if he were not relieved. The drag must be put on, at last on wretched Ixion's wheel. These are some of the great figures of Greek mythology and Roman mythology that, uh, that are being punished for various uh, sins. Um, so Sisyphus is pushing a giant rock. Ixius is stretched out on a uh, on a on a wheel, being pulled uh, pulled apart. And uh, Tantalus can't can't taste water, even though he's dying of thirst, and it's always right there. Um, the uh, it was agreed that some new punishment must be devised. They must devise some new task, something with no effect, to suggest some craving without result. Then, then Aeacus, Aeacus decreed he should rattle dice forever in a box with holes in the bottom. At once the poor wretch proceeded to his fruitless task of hunting for dice, which forever slipped away. So this judge, this guy who is presumably presiding over a system of justice, uh, is supposed to be uh, forever rolling dice dice are a symbol of chance he's not uh he's not doing anything systematic at all he's not having any kind of uh, method in the madness there is no system there is just the random occurrence of outcomes and even in that he can't quite do it because they have rigged the game so that it's always just going to fall apart now, maybe this is Seneca complaining that when you have something so, uh, so haphazard, so, uh, so precarious, um, it will always fall apart. There is no system to there, so it can never work. Maybe that's him criticizing it and just using Claudius as a kind of vehicle for that. 
uh, at the end, uh, he is made, uh, Claudius is uh, rejected, uh, his bill, uh, his suit to, uh, to gain access to heaven is rejected, and he is, uh, he is actually dragged down to, uh, to hell, and he is made to uh, uh, watch law, co law, co law courts as a clerk. So he's no longer the figure of great dignity in, in the middle, middle of the proceedings. He's just sort of, you know, just another uh, pencil pressure on the, on, the far, uh, on the far perimeter of it. Um, so he, he's stuck in that hell of court without actually getting any of the perks of the ego. Uh, so that's Seneca really setting up the, uh, the peculiarity of, uh, of uh, Claudius as, a, uh, as an individual, but really boring in on the, uh, the characterization of the system of justice as it is and the notion of whether or not um, it can be systematized. In an ideal world, a Stoic would say, well, yes, you just have to have a dispassionate view of, uh, 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 of the process. And for, uh, for, for Seneca, Claudius represents a rejection of that because his rulings tended to be rather arbitrary. He was certainly very biased, and he didn't necessarily uh, hew to any system at all. Uh, he was interested rather than disinterested, and the Stoics reject that. The Stoics insist that you, in order for justice to work, for anything to work, you need, for any government system to work rather, for any public system, you need disinterested people. You need people to preside and rule from reason rather than interest and it's this story which is very funny and pokes fun at an awful lot uh this story underscores that saying you need to be objective you need to take a step back from your own interest now he does this with humor by taking a grand figure like claudius and putting him in rather uh silly a rather silly frame and so you automatically have to objectively take that you can you don't necessarily have to buy it it's all kind of ridiculous after all if you don't buy into it it is uh, meant to be ironic but that pose that that positioning of the reader as being a disinterested and um wary consumer of information let's say uh that is stoicism through and through.